Hi, everybody. This is a wee bit of alchemy. I'm Rick Barrett. Welcome. So tonight, we're going to return to a topic that has been spoken about a number of times, and it's kind of really woven into a lot of the approach we're using. But I'd like to take it a little bit deeper. Conversations recently have showed me that you know, more explanation might be helpful and more practice to, to do it. And that's the idea of central equilibrium, Zhang Ding. And I'd like to mm. you know, be able to get any uh, feedback here from, from you guys if uh, there's anything that, uh, any questions you might have about this and really just fine tune some of this by, uh, by reducing some of the moving parts down to uh, a very few and really getting into the, uh, the nitty gritty of it. And uh, again, I'd like to, uh, to there's, a, there's a quote from um, uh, uh, Douglas Weil who wrote, uh, who wrote an introduction for Ching Men Ching's book. And uh, he was talking about uh, how the, uh, the information in, in Taiji Chuan and Taiji Chuan practice itself is, can be likened to the plum in the square or the, yeah, the plum in the square. And uh, the idea is that a, a plumb line is something which is used to establish verticality. So uh, I don't have an actual plumb bob with me, but this will work. This, we talked a, a, a number of weeks ago about pendulums and how they, you know, uh, some of the qualities of a pendulum and um, particularly at that turnaround, you know, whenever, whenever the pendulum swinging side to side, there's a point which is infinitesimally small that where the pendulum turns around. And when that happens, the uh, velocity goes to zero and then it moves in the other direction. And when that velocity goes to zero, that is when the energy in the system is at its maximum. You're getting sleepy. Uh, the, uh, the, as it slows down, we're going, it's going to show up another quality. So the other thing about the, uh, the, the turnaround there is that it happens in zero time. So we have uh, the turnaround is is just boom. So anyway, the uh, the plumb bob as it slows way way down, uh, it establishes a point where a relationship between the point at the bottom and the point at the top, which is directly in accord with gravity. The line, you know, the line of gravity coming straight down so that whenever we can slow this down, I'm gonna have a difficult time doing it here in front of the camera, but the, uh, that, that establishes the vertical. So in carpentry, you, you wanna hang a door, you want that door to be plumb. That is, you want it to be able to not be bent over so that it requires a whole lot of, uh, of energy to move it. And also it's gonna bang into things if, uh, if you do that. So there's a, we use uh, the plumb bob to establish verticality. And the thing while is saying is that the plumb bob is, it works by tapping into a universal principle that is the direction of gravity. And this is something that is, it's, this is nature. And if we are, um, whatever position we're in, if I, even my body's turning, gravity is pulling down like that. So that's a constant. So this is something that is, this is the parts of Tai Chi that are nature. And they come from observations of nature. So the other part of the equation is the square. So here's a little bitty square, it's a speed square, but it's uh, the idea here is we have um, a relationship to the verticality. 
if we establish this along the plumb line, then this is 90 degrees. Well, nature doesn't care about perpendicular. Nature doesn't care about 90 degrees. It's something that's a man-made concept. And so there are other parts of Taiji Chuan which are products of human invention. But we have this, which is the other side, which is, oh, okay, what, what can we do? What inferences can we make from these things that nature is giving us? And that's where we get into the, we get into the square that we have this idea of 90 degrees square is, is a human concept. You, nature really is, is not really terribly interested in making things perpendicular. It does, however, pull constantly in this vertical fashion, which is, it's saying, yeah, I, I really do care about this verticality thing, this gravity thing. And so it's, there's a constant pull down in, in a, a direct line. So when we have uh, central equilibrium, we're working, we're trying to find that perfect plumb line in this, this, the system so that we can then do things from that. So we can take our squares and, and move off of that. The um, an interesting thing about the plumb line is you may see, that, okay, so what's this doing? So this thing is gonna create a, a, a verticality there, which states the relationship between the top point and the bottom point. But that relationship, it's, it's um, insubstantial. So we focus on the plumb bottom. We say, oh, that, that line, that's, that's, that's the important thing. Ah, okay, good. So, no, that, that line is just a tool to help us visualize something which is invisible, something that is, it's insubstantial, that relationship. And uh, same thing happens with central equilibrium we stack up our meat sculptures in a way so that they're able to move as effortlessly as possible. Um, and we do it by aligning to this insubstantial, invisible central line, the central pillar. And that foundation, that central pillar, then if the closer we can get to that, the more efficient and effective we are at extending out from that. The farther we move away from center, the more we have to, uh, uh, we then have to uh, make adjustments, it uses more energy. So at the beginning, as we're discovering this, we, we you know, create this central, central pillar, which is really great so that, oh, okay, good, I get this. And so I'm just going to walk around like this all the time so that it's, I have this, this perfect, perfect meat sculpture that, that stacks things up nice and easy. But it doesn't work that way. Once you get that awareness of the insubstantiality, once you get attuned to that, that plumb line, that invisible plumb line that goes through you, then you can start to play with your body in terms of how it aligns. So then you don't, once you get that going, then you're able to find your central equilibrium in improbable places. We return in, in our practice, we return to to verticality just to train ourselves. Oh yeah, this is, this is what it feels like to be in central equilibrium. And we do that so that we can then not do that and be able to then find central equilibrium even if we are in an odd position, even if we're stacking the meat in a way that is doesn't look exactly right. So if we, uh, 
let's say for instance, you know, if I'm, I'm standing like this, I get, I establish my verticality and get a really get a good feeling of that insubstantiality. <sighs> good. So then, you know, I start, when that happens, I start to connect up to the big G. I start to connect up to the earth and sky. And that's really cool. So then if I want, I can, by keeping a tuning, not to the physical form or the plumb line, but to the, that insubstantial quality, that insubstantial relationship, I can then change my body's position so that I'm able to find central equilibrium in various ways so that I still remain connected, rooted, and retain the power that is with that I have with the central equilibrium. And that's where the we the, the practice is to get so familiar with the substantial part. And we're gonna go over that again, just to, to really tune into that and uh, feel into the insubstantial that we, that we get uh, you know, from it. And then we can start to play around with other structures, other forms. Um, something I was writing recently, I, I talk about it's like kind of like um, learning to ride a unicycle. So we have a, a unicycle, which is one wheel, and it doesn't do a very good job of standing up by itself. It's a, it requires somebody there working the pedals and who is under, understands the relationship of a body sitting on this saddle, working these pedals and moving this thing around through space. So that is, uh, it's a, a fairly tricky thing to do. But once you get it, you can go on YouTube and find all kinds of tricks that people do with unicycles. You know, they'll, they'll hop up, you know, hop, jump up on curbs or, uh, do it uh, right along a fence and then bounce down and or hop from one place to another. There's uh, one guy does you know hops from one pillar to another pillar. It there's all kinds of weird stuff that gets to be done with a unicycle once you get the hang of that. But there's a particular feel to it. It's so I guess a lot of what I'm talking about here is moving away from just thinking about the, the form and how we get to that place and to start to make an adjustment where you actually are looking for the golden fleece of that perfect central equilibrium. Because when that happens, whenever you, the closer you get to it, the more cool stuff opens up then you, you start to align with the, the energies of heaven and earth and it, it really just fills up your whole system and you start playing with energies which are not strictly your own. You're tapped into the big chi and that allows you to, to move uh, and, and do cool stuff with that. So uh, let me see if there are any questions so far on what we've covered, anybody? Valerie. Well, I know what you're talking about. Uh, I have no idea how I do it. I know there are some um, postures in the form that I do that uh, I know I'm, I'm not in that, let's call it central, central equilibrium. If you tapped me with a finger, I'd fall over because it's like a, a snake creeps down where you're down low you know and you're on one leg and you're not your upper body is not vertical um and that's always been uh a sticking point for me 
you know, I know I can get that central equilibrium not being absolute vertical, but that particular position is like, yeah, I, I want you to tell me how I fix that. <laughs> 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 That's a that's a very good very good point, and that's something that um, you can fix it. You know, I'm sure you know people who can do a very yeah you know, sturdy state creeps down, and uh, so it's a question of of what what's the uh, what are the doorways into the posture so that you're not actually working against your own interests in that case. So that. Uh, uh, I'm going to take that as, as a rhetorical uh, question rather than something we're going to specifically direct our attention to right now, because that is, uh, that is the case. I mean, a lot of why I uh, got into this uh, were um, into exploring this is because people are having a lot of trouble with the kicks in the Taiji form. You know, how do I, how do I stand? How do I balance myself while I'm kicking and to be able to do it with enough, you know, to be able to execute a kick so that if I were to actually kick someone or something in that posture, I would not just knock myself on my own butt. And so that's where the, that's where the game is. And obviously people can do that. We, we have seen people who can, who can do that very nicely. So uh breaking that down so that how do we get to to do that and it has to do with establishing your central equilibrium going into it and then as you transition from the posture before and into the kick you have to maintain your central equilibrium each step of the way and the same thing i think would hold with the uh with the snake creep down posture where you have to find your central equilibrium going into it and not do anything which then pops you out of that. So the, um, uh, again, it's going back to how do I get so familiar with the energy of this that I can do it anytime I want. And I can also recognize when, oh, I'm no longer in central equilibrium. And that requires familiarization with the insubstantial aspect of that. And um, when we get that, uh, that connection, then cool stuff happens. We're able to, to then uh, feel the energies in such a way that allows us to be able to handle incoming force or be able to issue power anytime we we want from that without being bowled over. So uh, Maria, you want to give me a hand with this? So just uh, just uh, to, to demonstrate. So, so we want to get you into a central equilibrium, okay? We're going to feel the balls of the feet, reach with the crown of the head. That's it. Good. Good. Elbows. Good. There you, there you go. Good. So when Maria is in this, in this posture, I can push in. I can push in very hard, and she's not going anywhere. But not only that, the whole structure gets very strong. She's like this, and she's in that posture. And I try to push her, her arms together. It's not happening. If she just rocks back in her heel just a little bit, then it doesn't take any energy at all to collapse the structure. So there's an insubstantial quality that comes from orienting to that central pillar that is disappears when we when we move off of that. So if we take that that same feeling now and we put Maria in an awkward position, she now has to find that how to find her central equilibrium in this structure. It's not really conducive to, to <laughs> doing it with, with muscle. You can't do this with muscle, but it, it works really nicely whenever you are 
creating that, that insubstantial central equilibrium. Then we take her over and bend over like that and reach out like this. And we say, okay, how do I find my central equilibrium here? It's the same kind of deal that I push it and, and I can't move her for any, anything. So it's a, uh, this is, thank you. So this is the quality that we get. Go Maria. Uh, this is the quality we get from central equilibrium. We get to plug into the big G, which then allows us to do cool stuff. The uh, ability to withstand a push, of course, is, is very cool, but it's only an indicator of the energetic connection that is occurring there. That's just one, one trick that we do with, with energy that allows us to, uh, you know, it, to demonstrate the, uh, the power of, of that connection. There's a, a quote from uh, Confucius where he talks about, uh, he talks about equilibrium is the great foundation of the world and harmony its universal path. When equilibrium and harmony are realized to the highest degree, heaven and earth will attain proper order and all things will flourish. And it's kind of the way you feel when you're in central equilibrium, when you get it. So it's like, oh, okay, things are plugged in in such a way that all things will flourish. So um, we're going to do a little thing with uh, central equilibrium. And um, just it can, we're going to keep it real simple. And the focus will be on taking your own particular game to a new level so that you can, you can discover even more of that insubstantial quality and also notice where your limits are in terms of, of getting there. And um, so any questions before we go on here? Just before we uh, keep this, Richard. Um, let let me just let me try a thought that I had. Okay. Does this have anything to do with learning to create central equilibrium when the center does not appear to be in the middle of the structure? That is one of the. That's the exercise we just did. So that certainly was that. Uh, but um, uh, that that's that's further down the line. You know, first we we feel it as when it is in the center of the structure, and we kind of. But we want to be able to split apart this substantial aspects. That is, how do I stack my meat versus the insubstantial, which is this this thing that we can't even talk about, that we can just kind of throw things at and hope something sticks. But it's uh, that insubstantial quality is, is goes beyond our, our ability to encapsulate in language. We can describe it a little bit. We can say it's a relationship between these two points, but it's um, that won't help us get there because I've, I've, I've been trying that for years to teach people and no matter what words I use, it's not, it doesn't translate because the body has to discover a new way of being. And, and, and that means shedding decades of patterning to be able to get to that place. Because we don't start off knowing this stuff. This is stuff that is, this is new. This is not nature here. We're, this is, this is man-made when we uh, getting it, we're trying to, find that that nature place but it's uh it's something that you have, you have to really work at scott you have something yeah um that all makes perfect sense i'm just not sure how the um square fits in like you said if you took that square out in nature you would never find anything that it matched right so right. what is what does it have to do with anything the price of tea in china um so let's say when you're if i'm hanging a door I establish my plumb line, right? I get my plumb bob out and I, oh, okay. I establish my plumb line and say, okay, this is vertical, boom. And 
from that, I can say, all right, so then I can take my square and say, this is, the door is gonna swing like this. It's going to swing. And so I have to align that. So then I get my, the header of my door is gonna come across and, and I establish a little box that the door is gonna swing in. And if it's off a quarter of an inch, the door is not gonna close or it'll, it'll bang into something, it'll, it'll get stuck or whatever. So I have, to, I have to be very precise. The square helps me do that. The square helps me to get very precise about the relationship between that verticality and this man-made concept of a rectangle. And uh, so we like, oh, okay, yeah, a, a rectangle. We we love our rectangles. You know, we uh, we we all are these closet Euclideans, and we just uh, we love to uh, love these these structures. But it's uh, it's not nature. It's 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 something humans do, and and then we get to hang a door or a window or whatever. And so that's uh, the analogy. Then is once I establish my center equilibrium, then my movements are going to be in relation to that that central line. And then what? Then I get oh, I have I'm able to to create forms that are quite varied and exploratory. Does that make sense? So you're just saying from whatever your central equilibrium is, then the movement from it is is perpendicular. Is that what you're, you're saying? No, no, it, it, it's not, yeah, I still ain't getting it. The perpendicular just it's, it's an it's an it's just an analogy. Okay. The the uh, the movements can be in any number of directions. Just as the square, the square here has as a forty five degree angle too. So it, right. it tells us, oh, oh, we can do we can do fun things with forty fives also, right. and then we can also create uh, other shapes with that as well. So they are uh, it's a tool that allows us to invent new shapes because if we everything was just vertical, it'd be pretty boring. We want to we want to be able to create other shapes too. So that's uh, so in Taiji we get we have a lot of squares coming off of the uh, off of that plumb line. Okay, cool. Let's uh, let's do some stuff. All right, so put your heels together, toes apart. And you want to feel the balls of your feet. And just to remind you, that's on the big toe line. I think the metatarsophalangeal joint, I think is the, is the technical name for it, but it's that big knobby thing uh, on your foot before you get to, before you get to the big toe. So you want to feel, feel that. The weight is spread throughout the foot, but it's primarily focused on that joint. Knees are soft. So that means you're not bent so far down that you have to strain, but they're not locked either. You're just unlocked. And you want to just bring your weight so that you're feeling more contact with that, that ball of your foot. Now reach with the crown of your head. So that means that you're extending the crown upward toward the ceiling but you're not using effort to do that. You're just kind of reaching. 
And as you do that, you want to bring the chin in a bit. And by that, I don't mean drop it like this. So you're looking down the ground. You just want to draw it in so that you're now opening up the jade pillow gate. Now, a lot of this will be review for everybody, but we're, we're slowing it way down to a guided meditation here. So, so that we can take this to another level. But very often we take certain words and we transform them into alg algorithms and then we kind of just say, oh yeah, I just, I do that. And I want you to feel into it in a brand new unit of time as if you've never done this before. And you're discovering what it feels like to open up the jade pillow gate. What and simultaneously feeling the balls of your feet. Making that sure that contact's there. So you're, the sense of your body is going to be like you're on a diving board and you're getting ready to dive into the water. So you wanna feel a certain precariousness to that. Like you're almost feel like you're falling forward but you're not, you're really just standing upright. And just for contrast, go back into your heels and just feel the difference in the energy when you do that. And lock your knees and feel into your heels. And there may be a certain comfort that comes from that, but you can also sense that something happened to the energy, something changed. So let's go back, unlock the knees and bring the body so that it's vertical. And the, the plumb bob extends from the crown of your head down through the balls of your feet. Now, this is a radical idea here. And there'll be many people who will advise against this. Who'll say, no, no, you want to be a lot. You want to have all your weight in your, in your heels and things like that. But we've done enough of this in this class that uh, we, we start, we're starting to trust this. So notice too that as we do this, there's a dynamic relationship. It's almost like our plumb bob is kind of still kind of swaying a little bit. As your body is looking for that center line. Relax your lower back and allow your pelvic bowl, because a lot of us have, have a pelvic bowl that's tilting forward. We want to have it so that it is parallel to the ground. So, and the, another thing that, that a lot of people do is they have one leg will be shorter than the other, the pelvic bowl will be tilted like this. And uh, it'll feel like their one leg is shorter than the other. When in actuality, if you just readjust the pelvic bowl, the legs will be, they'll, they'll be the same length. So we want to start to release the muscular tension that prevents us from having that. So as we relax the lower back, then they allows the coccyx to drop, point down toward the ground. And this, there's a, a point there called the Wei Lu, which is located at the very end of the sympathetic nervous system bunch is a ganglion, they call the ganglion of impar, is the technical name for it, the bio biological name for it. The energy point is called the Wei Lu. And that's where the 
sympathetic nervous system, which runs in parallel lines down your spine, converges into one point at that point there. So as we relax and drop that, while simultaneously reaching up with the crown, we're creating space between the vertebrae. We're also lengthening the dural tube and unkinking any obstructions that might be happening in that. And the dural tube is what it what holds the cerebral spinal fluid, which bathes your brain and your spinal cord. And it goes down to the, the middle of your sacrum. So as we lengthen like that, then we kind of uh, open that up and allow the cerebral spinal fluid to flow more freely. By opening the jade pillow gate, we allow the cerebral spinal fluid to flow more freely into, uh, into and out of the brain. And we also allow for circulation, blood flow, more blood flow into the brain. Bring your elbows out slightly to the side. Feel reaching with that elbow, with the elbows and feel that connection there. And point with your index fingers, feel into your hands. At a substantial level, you may feel increased circulation, tingling, pulsing, heat, sense of fullness. At the insubstantial level, you start to tune into the energy there. Heat is infrared energy, so that's, that's, uh, that's an easy one. But there are other things that are being produced here as well, including visible light. The more coherent the system is, the more, the more you light up, the more you have bioluminescence in all the cells. And it creates kind of a glow. We see that in some people, the glow. And keep adjusting to that center line. And you find yourself kind of going back into a more comfortable position. You want to get back into precarious. You want to climb back on the unicycle and feel that dynamic relationship with the between the earth and the and the heavens. And you are the intermediary. And the Taoists say that you know the the two gives birth to the three. So yin and yang give birth to heaven, earth, and man, with uh, man being the intermediary between heaven and earth. Just pay attention to the energy that's being produced in the system, the heat for one thing, but there are other subtler energies that are being produced as well. You don't have to identify them. You don't have to name them. Just notice that something's going on. Now feel the ball of your right foot. You're just bringing your awareness to that. So notice that when you do that, you're kind of taking it away from other things, including the ball of the left foot and placing it on the ball of the right. And just by bringing your awareness of the ball of the right foot, you begin the process of creating substantiality in the right leg. Feel that. Note just that simple things begins that process, even though the weight is still 50-50, we have this 
enhanced substantiality there. The right leg is more there than the left because our awareness is on that. So now bring your knee out so that you feel it set right over the ball of the foot. Your right knee set over the ball of the foot. So you're feeling that. And you're creating this very stable foundation in your right leg. Because we're going to build on that foundation. That's how we get this central equilibrium to work is we, we have this trusting relationship with our, with our foundation. Now you're going to spiral down, releasing tension in the hip joint and spiral down to the left. So you're in your right leg, spiraling down to the left. So you're loading up that right leg. So that substantial leg is getting even more substantial. We've gone from 50-50, now it's about 70-30. You get about 70% in your right leg and it's doing a lot more work. You just feel the stability of that, of that posture, finding your central equilibrium in that. You may have to have a conversation with your calf muscles because you're asking them to do something which you, just, you might not be doing a lot of, but they'll forgive you someday. And now turn, your, when I say turn, you're gonna turn the waist. That means leading from the hips, you're gonna turn. So we've already established a releasing the quad. Okay, we've, we're settling into that. So we've got 70% in the right leg and we're gonna turn to the right, the, the torso turns as a unit, hips and shoulders turn at the same time. So what's happened now, we've, the right leg has become even more substantial. Notice that as I turn, what I'm not doing is I'm not pushing my butt out to the side, nor am I pushing it back, right? I am rotating and maintaining my center over the ball of that foot, the right foot. So keeping that reaching with the with the knee one with the, the, the crown, feeling the ball of the foot as I turn. And as I'm doing it, also I'm emptying out the left leg. So I've got about 90% of my weight in my right leg now. And my left leg is sort of just hanging out. It's not supporting me. And I want to feel that substantiality. I pick up the left heel. And as you do that, you want to sink a little more into that right leg, only because you want to reestablish your substantiality. You feel that heel, and as you do that, you kind of ah, really release at the quad. You're settling down so that then you can pick up your left foot and step out to the side. And you want to be able to do that without a whole big shift in your body so that you can step in, step out, step in without a big adjustment to your central equilibrium. There's still going to be a conversation going on. But you want to be able to just oh, make that step and make an empty step. So you're not lunging into that left foot. You're just establishing that. You still have about 90% in your right leg. And, but you've established a point over on the, uh, with your left foot. And you feel the ball of the left foot. And now we're, what we're doing, we're starting to create substantiality in the left foot. because that's going to start to take more of the load now. We set the left knee. So 
you're going to feel the left knee is going to be in such a way that you start to to connect the dots with the with the ball of the foot. And spiral down to the right. So you're starting to load up the left by releasing the left claw and you're taking the substantiality out of the right leg and you're filling up into the left. Not all the way, you just you don't want to get in about 50% there. You're releasing down. So now you're going to turn the waist. So here we go again, where we're the whole, you're moving from the hip joints. You know, the whole pelvis turns and the shoulders turn with it and you pivot on the right heel. So that now you're facing forward and your weight is 50-50. You're feeling the balls of both feet. And you, again, go back and continue your conversation between the heavens and the earth and say, okay, where is my central equilibrium now? And you find it. Shift, you get, ah, there it is, click. And you'll know it because it feels a little precarious. It feels a little dangerous. And that's when you know that you got the, the energy is plugged in and you can feel into your hands now and notice the energy that's flowing throughout the body. Now feel the ball of the right foot, set the right knee and spiral down to the left. So you're feeling that central equilibrium, loading up the right so you can now step in with your left foot. Take a deep breath, inhale. and exhale and disappear the chi, dissolve all form, just feel yourself dissolving into a mist. Letting go of the energy, letting go of the form and just feeling into that. Yeah. Okay, take a seat. Ice cream truck. <laughs> There's nothing I can do. About it. Nothing we can do about it. Yes. Okay, Eddie. Uh... How'd it go for everybody? Good, good, <laughs> good, good. Any questions, thoughts, complaints? Jazz hands, Rick. <laughs> Scott. So um, as you know, I've been having some ten trouble with my neck. Um, and doing that, I was having a real hard time keeping the tension at them, the top of my shoulders. And my right calf was really kind of pain. Yeah, almost almost crampy kind of pain, but not quite. So is that just keep working on it? 
Uh, well, yeah, keep letting go, because all that all that tension is just your body, you, you know, getting conflicting signals about what it should be doing. You know, the calf is, you know, we're we're asking it to do something it it doesn't like to do, which is to be in that position. Although for you, you know, you do a lot of walking, so you get, uh, you know, your calves are plenty strong. It's just they're they're not they don't like the fact that you're you're springing this new thing on them, and so it's uh they they're they're protesting that a little bit, you know, saying you know, hey, what's the big deal, buddy? But uh, you know, familiarization will get you uh, will get you over that. Cool. Anybody else? Valerie. Um. I have found, and thanks to your help, uh, that my biggest, I don't want to say problem necessarily area, but it's its in the pelvis. It's in the, the way loo, actually. Um, and as you do anything, it's, uh, it feels like a bit of a gyroscope, you know, that's moving and then it's got to get balanced again. Uh, and so just being super aware that with movement that it you know you can establish it again but you don't want it to go okay you know all like this and then have to come back but there's adjustments going on all the time even while standing quote unquote perfectly still and feeling that precariousness i get that i get what you're talking you know i mean i i feel that um uh, uh and feeling the uh you know, the relaxation in the quad and staying with that and then but constantly having to tip that tailbone constantly. Um, yeah. But it, that was, it was great. I mean, you know, it was great. Yeah, oh yeah, my calf just hates you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, and you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, I, I and, you know, sticking with it, of course, is required if you're going to get anywhere with this. Uh, so, you know, it's like, okay, yeah, calf, here you are. Yep, you hate me, you hate him, all right. of that. But let's go look at this thing. Let's go look at this pretty shiny thing that, you know, <laughs> has to be adjusted, you know, and uh, is it going to make me feel any better? No, you're still going to have to work hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You gotta suffer if you want to sing the blues. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's not a, it's not a wow, what a realization, but it did give me a great deal of time to really focus on that and what minor adjustments are. You know, it's like just, it's just a, a minor thing, but with great repercussions. You know, yes. it's like you make that little adjustment and. Oh, I'm back in precariousness. You know, I was, oh, okay, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. And I didn't find the, the lifting or reaching with the crown so difficult to maintain. But you know, if you make the, if you make that adjustment here, you know, with reaching with the crown, my way Lou goes, you know, just goes to crap. And so I have to make that minor adjustment again. So it's the it's yes. like talking about the plumb line, right? You know, if you change this a little bit, this has to move with it, right? So it's right. very cool, very cool exercise for me. Great, wonderful. Cool. Anybody else? Dennis? Yeah, I, well, I assume we're going to be working on this more. Um, I've been, the last few years, I've been studying William Chen's 60 form, and I'm really struggling with the kicks, especially the one in the end where you spin all the way around. I'm, yeah. hoping this, I'm hoping this will give me some resolve. Cool. Yeah, it's, um, uh, like I said, that was uh, the inspiration for a lot of this, day, a lot of this discovery is like, how do we, get, how do we do that and, and make it be real? How do we, how do we make those kicks actually not just look good, but actually do something? Yeah, how, how, do we, actually how do we maintain the equilibrium while we're doing it? So that's uh, a whole lot, uh, uh, a whole lot of work went into that. But good, good. So yeah, it, uh, I'll be looking forward to hearing from uh, hearing your report as you 
as you explore yeah. that. Yeah. One one thing I would suggest to you is uh, don't overdo it. Don't yeah. try to get your kick up, you know, shoulder height or anything. You know, just just bring bring it up so that it's you know wherever that feels in control. Yeah, yeah. I'm not. It's not so much being able to just kick, just be able to spin around and stay upright. I'd be happy. Right. And if you think of it as not spinning around but stepping around, okay, it will help. It will help because it. Uh, you want to be rooted as you go around. So each step of the way. So the uh, you know uh, I did it wrong for decades before I you know, figure it out how to do it correctly. So it's, uh, okay. it, um, what you don't want to do is launch yourself into this, into this turn. You, it was uh, like slowing the mousetrap down enough so you can see it. Yeah, right. you know, it, it, it. Things happen so quick, you just, you just don't see how it goes, you know? Right. So, uh, yeah, so I'll be interested to hear what you have to say about that. Cool. Everybody good? Uh, any other, anybody other questions, comments? All good. Great. Good to see you. Uh, no, uh, the Wednesday class, we're going to hold off on that. If you, uh, anybody wants to, uh, wants to offer suggestions for, for the Wednesday class, please uh, let me know. Um, uh, for right now, we're going to park that and, uh, we're going to continue with the, the Tuesday for uh, the foreseeable yes. future. So, okay. uh, great. Love to you all. Bye-bye. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Rick.